as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Feel the room. You're here, and I know you are moving. I'm here, and I know you will fill me. Calm down, Spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here, and I know you are moving. I'm here, and I know you will fill me.
you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me calm down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will fill me oh holy spirit Hey there, everybody. Thank you for welcoming me to wherever you are today. Hey, before we dig into the word, we do want to remind you that for the entire month of September, we are uh, doing what we are calling Ukraine Moldova Relief. As you know, there is still a war happening in the Ukraine. And as you also know, we have been partnering with the Orphan's Hands in Moldova for years and years and years. And over the last uh, Six to eight months, they have been in the Ukraine. They have been going into the Ukraine. They have been rescuing people. They have been uh, taking in those who are escaping into Moldova. They have been feeding them, housing them, and we have been partnering with them all throughout this time. And I'm excited to announce today that as of September the 5th, I think, or 6th, we looked at our THP Compassion, our missions giving for the year, and as of to date, we have given over $100,000 to missions already, which is the most that we have ever given in the history of this church dating all the way back to 1943. We are so thankful to have the opportunity to partner with the Lord, to get the gospel all over the globe, uh, to rescue, to relieve, to restore, all those different things that we talk about. And what we are doing for Ukraine Moldova Relief is we are taking in uh, at drop-off locations throughout the month of September uh, coats, blankets, personal items, all of those things. If you're not in our area and you can't drop off, we encourage you to give. thpshreveport.com, you can click on the online giving. I would encourage you to click on the realm and if you do not currently have an account, go ahead and set that up, and uh, you can give through that. Give to THP Compassion, and in the note, Ukraine Moldova Relief. And we are going to be getting everything that's given. Uh, we're using that to buy personal items, to buy coats, to buy blankets, all those different things. And then what we are doing is on October the 8th, we are packing everything up. Philip Cameron will be here on campus October the 9th. They will have uh, a truck. They will put it in that truck. They will take it, and then it will be shipped uh, to not Ukraine because they're closing off ports to Romania and then trucked across to the Ukraine. So a lot of different moving parts, but you can give, and I want to encourage you just in your giving. You know, we give ourselves to the Lord first, and then we give of our provision. We give to the Lord, and, and it is so encouraging that when we give first, our very first is our very best, and the Lord deserves our very best. You may call that your tithe. You may call that your first fruit. Whatever you call that, we believe in that. And so I encourage you in your giving. If you're a part of the online community, and this is a feeding ground for you per se, this is a place where you grow and mature, I want to encourage you, sow a seed. Give, you know, give of yourself to this. Uh, there's a lot of different moving parts in this, a lot of different people that are involved in bringing this to you. And uh, we just encourage you to be a part and to partner with us in giving as we partner with the Lord all over the world. So with that, 
Acts 2.42. We have been in this thing we're calling Jesus Church, and we are landing this thing. Now, we are, we're not landing to stop what we're doing. We're simply transitioning. But as far as Jesus Church, this concept of what is the church, we are kind of landing today in our last message of this Jesus Church. In Acts 2.42, we've been talking about this uh, for weeks now. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to be Jesus' church? Let's read again what, we, what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we talked about in Jesus' church, we as the body, not a building, we as the body, that Jesus is the foundation. Jesus to Christ, the Son of the living God, is the foundation. Jesus is building his church on that foundation. He is building it, not us. And that now we, as living stones, the small stones, that we fill with the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is building his church. And we went back to the original, Acts 2.42. Uh, what was the four priorities? What were the four priorities of the early church? Well, it was the apostles' teaching. Teaching, we talked about that. We talked about what it means to be truly in fellowship with Jesus and one another. Kononia, participation with one another. To the breaking of bread. Not just in, just like communion, but what does it really mean? And today, we land at the prayers. Now listen, we believe in this so much. That here on campus, we have taken Wednesdays. We're calling them first things. First things, Wednesday night. And on these Wednesday nights, the first Wednesday night, we're doing teaching. The second Wednesday night of every month, we're doing fellowship. The third, we're doing the breaking of bread. The fourth, we're doing the prayers. We believe that these are priorities, not just for the early church, but for us as the church. These are priorities. And so where we land today is we're going to be talking about the prayers. Now again, Jesus said that I will build my church. And one of the things he said in that scripture was this. Now pay attention to this. Jesus didn't say the gates of hell would not prevail against him, but rather against his church. Catch that. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it or them, us. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. He used the term the gates of hell. That's a defensive when you think of gates, you don't think of something that's moving forward. You think of something that's standing ground. Whatever's behind it, it's guarding it, right? It's a defensive posture. But I'm thankful that I serve a king and I serve a kingdom that's not defensive. We're on the offensive. We are on the offensive. We're moving forward. We're growing. We're maturing. And as the gates of hell stand, why is that gates of hell defensive? Because the kingdom of darkness holds many people captive behind those gates for whom Jesus died. Listen, we're not just proclaiming Jesus to the world. We are proclaiming Jesus to the world for people who are held captive by darkness, by the enemy of our soul, that the gates of hell have them held captive. And we are declaring Jesus. Jesus is building his church. And the gates of hell, those very things, can't hold us back. We have broken through that. And now we are declaring Jesus for those who are held back. We are on the offensive. We are taking ground Right? We are taking ground for the kingdom of God. And Paul understood this. Paul understood the defensive posture of the gates. Because he said this in Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul understood, listen, we're not wrestling against people, but principalities, powers. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities. Listen, if we were wrestling against flesh and blood, we would not need prayers because we could just do it physically. But we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. How do you deal with principalities? You deal with principalities in the authority of Jesus through prayers, through declaration, through the word of God through worship, through praise, through all of those things, that, that is what helps to tear down strongholds. We are wrestling, right, in a sense. We are wrestling, or for those of you who used to watch it when you were kids, wrestling, right? We are wrestling 
against not flesh and blood, but principalities. How do you deal with that? It's in Jesus' name that's how we deal with it. He's building his church, and those gates cannot prevail against us. And so what we want to talk about today in the prayers, listen, it's plural today. It's not the prayer. It's the prayers. One thing I want to talk to you about today is this, the power of the tongue. Because there's a misconception about prayer, that prayer is simply a posture of the mind. And that's a misconception. Throughout the word of God, prayer is speaking. It's declaring. It is speaking to God. It is declaring the word of God. It's not just thinking. Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, not thinking. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying. Jesus taught his disciples, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven. Listen, how many of you are thankful that the Lord is not looking for our thoughts? How many thoughts do you have every day? There's this misconception that if I think it, then God knows it and he'll answer it. But that's not the way that God defined prayer. He didn't define prayer as thinking. How many thoughts do you have throughout the day? Listen, we, we get this misconception that, oh, I'm just going to think about it. Well, guess how many more thoughts are in the midst of that thinking? Guess how many more thoughts are coming in to all of that and mingling in? But when you declare it, when you speak it, when you verbalize it, it gets a focus. God's promise was not that he will answer our thoughts, but he would answer our prayers. Listen, life and death, according to Proverbs 18, are not in the power of the mind, but the power of the tongue. Not the power of the mind, but the power of the tongue. God knows our thoughts. Check this out. God knows our thoughts, but he answers our prayers. Man, that's a good word right there. Somebody needs to be dropping a bomb in the chat right now. Somebody needs a fire emoji right now, head exploding, whatever emoji that is. God knows our thoughts, but he answers our prayers. I'm so thankful that God is not throwing judgment on me for all of my thoughts. I'm taking those thoughts captive to the subjection of Christ. And then when I open my mouth, my words are not mingled with all those other thoughts because I've taken it captive. And now what I took captive and I cast it out, now all I have left is what is to the Lord. And when I do that, it's not mingled with all those other nasty thoughts and those other bad thoughts and those other thoughts that the enemy has tried to get into my mind and get into my heart. But now I've taken them all subject to to Christ, the authority of Christ. And now out of my mouth comes a focused prayer and a declaration to God. And he answers that. It's not just any words, though. You can't just say any words. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Praying according to God's will. How do I know God's will? Well, one way that you know God's will is in everything give thanks. Why? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's what the word of God says. Listen, if you go to God with thanksgiving, guess what? You're in his will. And when you go to God in thanksgiving, guess what that opens up? That opens up that now what you're speaking towards God is not filled with bitterness and anger and unforgiveness because you're thankful in everything you're thankful. Not for everything, but in everything and through everything you're thankful. Lord, I'm not thankful for this trial. I'm not thankful for this thing that's coming against me, but in it I am thankful because God, you've got me. Even when I don't feel like you got me, you got me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, Lord. That if I'm in a valley and there's a shadow, that means there's light around the corner. There's always light. There's always light. I'm never alone. I'm never alone. You see how that changes everything. We go to him with praise. We go to him with thanksgiving. Why? Because now it changes our mindset. It changes the posture of our heart. And now what comes out of our mouth is in line with the will of God. The word of God reveals God's will. Listen, when we think about praying according to God's will, it has to do with intimacy, relationship, proximity. Jesus said, I and the Father am one. I only do what I see the Father doing, right? Intimacy, relationship. Jesus knew the will of the Father. 
Through what? Through intimacy, through relationship, that we are one. I'm tied, right? We are tied to the vine. The vine is Jesus, and the vine dresser is the Father. We are tied. As long as we're tied in, there's intimacy and there is relationship, and we can know the will of God. The Word of God reveals God's will. For example, James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. How do you know how to pray God's will? Use the Word of God to pray God's will. James 1 says what? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all who without reproach and it will be given to him. So you could pray this. Father, I ask you for wisdom regarding this situation in the name of Jesus and I thank you that according to your word, it will be given to me. Boom, you've just prayed God's will because it's in alignment with God's word. Listen, God's word also teaches us that God answers faith. Jesus said, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Listen, reading and praying the word of God builds our faith. Praying and talking to God builds our faith. Praying for and with one another builds our faith. And when our faith is built, then what comes out of our mouth is in line with God's will. Listen, God responds to sincere prayers. Come on, put that in the chat right now. Sincere, sincere sincere prayers. Now, I'm sure there are, there are wordplay people out there that would make some really cool illustration about how the first three letters of sincere is sin and all that mess. I don't care about any of that. It's not sin. It's sincere. That means purity of heart. That means when I pray, I'm not just reciting what somebody else said because it's their words. It, it, it's when I, when I pray, I'm not just saying words, but it's from a pure heart. It's sincere. Sincerity is not concerned with pleasing and impressing others. See, that was the issue with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They wanted to be seen for what they were doing. They wanted their prayers to be heard. They wanted people impressed by the language of their prayers. I don't care how awesome your words are. I don't care that you wrote a two and a half page prayer and you're saying it in public because you're trying to be political. That happens every day across this nation. People get up and they're reading these prayers. And I'm not saying that they're not sincere. Only God knows that. But what I am saying is a lot of times there's no power behind it because it isn't sincere. It's not from the heart. It's not in the moment. Sincerity is not concerned with pleasing and impressing others, nor is it arrogant or proud. Two blind men in Matthew 20 heard. They simply heard that Jesus was passing by and they cried out. They were told to shut up, yet they cried out all the more to Jesus. Now, before you jump on a platform and go, yeah, you tell them, blind guys. They didn't do it in rebellion. They did it with sincerity. They didn't do it to be rebellious toward those who told them to shut up. They did it with sincerity on heart, believing that Jesus could heal them. In Acts 12, Herod killed James, the brother of John, and he arrests Peter, and he's intending to kill him. And Acts 12, 5 says this, Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made to God intensely by the church. The church began praying intensely, not superficial prayers to impress, intensely with passion, crying out. And what did the Lord do? The Lord sent an angel to deliver Peter from prison supernaturally. What did the church do when Peter came knocking at the door? They could not believe it was him. They prayed intensely that he would be released and then couldn't believe it when he was released. How many times do we pray believing, but when God sends the answer, we don't believe it's the answer? Lord, help us. Help us. Deliver us from our doubt, Lord. That when you answer, we actually recognize. Because listen, they delayed the entrance for Peter into the house to the church because of their unbelief. God answered and they wouldn't even receive the answer. They almost had to be convinced that it was the answer. When God answers, just believe it and receive it. The church prayed intensely. Do you think a superficial prayer made to impress somebody that the Lord is going to dispatch an angel to deliver you from a prison, break all the doors open supernaturally? No, he's not going to do that with doubt. It's going to be faith. It's going to be intensity. It's going to be passion. 
Listen, it talked about the prayers, not just the prayer, the prayers. When it says the prayers in Acts 2.42, it's from two plural Greek words, meaning various kinds of prayers. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds, plural, of prayers, plural. 1 Timothy 2.1, I urge you that supplications, plural, prayers, plural, intercessions, plural, thanksgivings, plural, be made for all people. Listen, prayers mentioned in the New Testament, praise, thanksgiving, worship, confession, petition, supplication, intercession, agreement, in the spirit, healing, deliverance, blessing. All those are types of prayers. Like we don't just come into this funnel of one specific prayer, but it is prayers. Your personal prayer. Jesus dealt with this in Matthew 6. When you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who's, who sees in secret will reward you. James five sixteen. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. The prayers of a righteous man avails much. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray without ceasing. Jesus' people develop the habit of daily prayers, plural, plural. Listen, when it says praying in the Spirit, listen, praying in the Spirit is a powerful, deeply personal way of praying. And I believe personally that it is one of the reasons why the enemy attacks this type of prayer so aggressively because it is deeply personal. It's deeply intimate. When we pray in the Spirit, there is a groaning. There is an intensity. And that intensity and that groaning comes out of a place of intimacy with the Lord. That's why I believe that the enemy aggressively comes after praying in the Spirit. Man, Scott, I'm just not sure about praying in the Spirit. Like, I'm just not sure, especially about like people who personally pray in tongues. I'm just not quite sure about that. You want to know one of the main reasons why the enemy comes to bring doubt to praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues personally is because of how intimate and deeply personal it is. That when you pray that way, you may not even know what you're praying, but you know that God is hearing you. You know that God is moving and doing something even though you can't quantify what just happened. Because it's out of a place that only God knows. It's out of a place that, that only God knows what's inside of you. Praying in the Spirit not only helps us to pray without ceasing, but it also builds us up according to the Word of God. Listen, it allows the Holy Spirit to help us pray the will of God precisely. In Jude chapter 1, verse 20, write that down. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray the will of God precisely. And then we hear about this prayer of agreement, right? This prayer of agreement. And here's where we're going to land today. Jesus taught his disciples a powerful way of praying. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth, about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Jesus began with these words, again, I say to you. What does that mean, Scott? He had already told them more than once. Again, I say to you. Okay, again, I say to you. What comes after that? If two of you shall agree on earth about anything they ask, Jesus has already taught them about agreement. And he's telling them again. Again, I say to you, if two of you, what does that mean? It means you're not alone. It means it's not just one individual. It means there's more. It means that two people, okay, if two agree, what does that mean? Those praying must agree for what they are asking for. On earth, what does that mean? That means here, now, present. That means you're not coming into agreement with your dead relative. It's right here, right now. It's living beings coming into agreement. You say, Scott, is that really a thing? Yeah, that's really a thing where people think they can come into agreement with their dead loved ones. Praying for the dead. Listen, they've run their race. You can pray all you want. They have run their race. They have run their race. And God will be the one that stands in judgment of all of that. 
when Jesus says, if two of you shall agree on earth, here now, present, he said, they ask. They ask. Anything they ask. What does that mean? That means not one person praying while the other simply nods. That means they ask together. Praying together. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Acts 4, 23. We're given this amazing example of agreement. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John have been let go from prison, speaking the name of Jesus, and they go to their companions, the disciples, and it says, being let go, they went to their own companions, reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they meaning who? These companions, these disciples. When they heard that, they raised their voice to, the, they raised their voice to God with one accord. All these people raised their voice with one accord, almost as if it's one voice, and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his church. What are they doing? They're declaring the word of God. This is prophecy. They're declaring the word of God. They're praying the word of God in agreement with one another. Then they pray this. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, With the Gentiles and the people of Israel will gather together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done, saying, Lord, this has been your will. Now, Lord, it doesn't say kill Herod, kill Pontius Pilate. It says, now, Lord, just look on their threats and grant to your servants, grant to us that with all boldness they may speak your word, that Peter and John have come back. Lord, that they may speak your word. Grant unto your servants with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, they had prayed. They had prayed. Not Peter had prayed by himself. Not John had prayed by himself. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they, not just Peter and John, but all of them spoke the word of God with boldness. Now that's a prayer. These believers were praying the prayer of agreement. They all agreed. They all prayed. They all cried out. They prayed in such unity that the word of God says it was as if it was one voice and one mind. And how did God respond to this prayer? Look at Acts 5 verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Listen, don't think that God's not answering your prayer just because everybody's not joining you, just because everybody's not coming to Christ. You pray that prayer of faith with a sincere heart and believe that God will answer. They did not get discouraged. They didn't quit. Because nobody came to Christ. Because people weren't just rushing in to come to Christ. It says, none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Listen, those people didn't rush in, but now people are coming. People are coming. These people didn't, but these people are hearing the word and they're coming. Multitudes of both men and women And believers were increasingly added to the Lord so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least a shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And also a multitude gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed. Did everybody that was ever prayed for in the New Testament get healed? No. Did all of these people get healed? Yes. Well, what's the difference, Scott? Sovereignty of God. God is still sovereign. The sovereignty of God, the will of God. But what do we do? What's our part in it? We pray in faith and sincerity of heart. We pray. And too many times when we pray our prayers, plural, we are praying for an expected outcome that we already see in our own mind. And isn't it amazing how it always is to our benefit? Listen, sometimes when we pray and God moves, it's not necessarily to our benefit. It will be. God will work it out for our benefit, but it may not look like it. I just made this statement last night in a class. 
I said, hey guys, man, we pray and we pray in faith, but are we willing to receive the actions of that prayer? We love miracles, signs, and wonders, but we love the concept of miracles, signs, and wonders only if it benefits us. So if I pray that everybody in Christus Shumpert Hospital gets healed and they get healed, guess what happens the next day? People are losing their jobs. Why? Because they're there are no people in the hospital. Nobody's in a sick bed. You don't need janitors for certain wings of the hospital anymore. You don't need nurses. You don't need doctors. Why? Because everybody got healed. Do you see the repercussions? The repercussions of miracles, signs, and wonders are not always the things that we earthly see that are good. Sometimes we could see it as, man, this is terrible. People are out of work. God healed all these people. And that was the difference between the apostles and the disciples, the believers, and the Pharisees. Is that the apostles and the disciples, whatever happens, man, it is God, and it's going to work for our benefit. It may not look like it. What's one of the greatest revivals ever in the New Testament? You know what they got mad about? They got mad about the fact that people were getting delivered from witchcraft and demons and weren't worshiping the goddess Diana anymore and people weren't making money off the goddess Diana that they were making. They lost business and they got mad. What about the demoniac when Jesus heals the demoniac and the spirits, the legion, goes into the pigs Guess what? The people who were screaming about wanting the guy delivered, he gets delivered and now they're mad because they had lost money because of these pigs that had gone and drowned themselves and Jesus could do no miracles there. He had to go to the other side and when he went to the other side, guess what happened? Miracles, signs and wonders and Jesus stayed with them. Why? Because they didn't care about the repercussions. They wanted Jesus. Understand that our prayers... When they, are, when they are focused in with faith and sincerity, man, it does some damage. It breaks down some strongholds. It tears some things down that need to be tore down. And when God brings an answer, it always doesn't look the way that we think it should. Peter didn't look like Peter then. He looked like an apparition. He looked like a ghost. And they were afraid. Because the lens of doubt had covered their eyes. They were praying intensely with faith and sincerity of heart, but when God brought the answer, the lens of doubt came in. Guess what? If the enemy can't catch you in the middle of your intense prayers, he will try to bring doubt when the answer comes. That's a good word right there, y'all. Jesus' church is a praying church. Not just one kind of prayer, but all various kinds of prayers. Because we recognize that every situation isn't the same. Every person's situation is not the same. Every scenario is not the same, even if the same people are involved. If it's a different day, a different time, it is a different season. Sometimes we're going to pray and it's going to be loud and aggressive. Sometimes we're going to pray and it's going to be very quiet, almost like a whisper. There's going to be times that we do warfare and it's very aggressive. And there's going to be times we do warfare and it's very quiet. Why? Because the season, the moment, the moment, the season kind of dictates that. And so what I want to say to you today is that Jesus' church, being built by Jesus, it's on Jesus, being built by Jesus, it is powerful because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And what do we do now? Listen, it is the teaching. It is the teaching, doctrine. We need it. we got to have it. Fellowship, Konania, we've got to be a part of it. Not just be a part of it, but we got to share in it and we got to give a share to. We receive from it and we give to it. The breaking of bread. That intimate breaking of bread. Where we see the elements and we see that breaking of bread. And Jesus gave us this physical manifestation of a very spiritual act. And then the prayers. The prayers, the prayers, the prayers. The prayers. So right now, I want you just to lean in, and I want you to pray. Not a prayer that I'm going to pray, but I want you to pray. Where, Where is it right now? Where are you in your heart right now? You pray. You lean into that right now, right where you're at. Maybe it's praise. Maybe it's worship. Maybe it's intercession. Maybe it's agreement with somebody that's with you right now. Whatever that prayer is, 
you pray it right now. And we're going to believe that as you pray in faith and sincerity of heart, that God is going to answer you. But when he does, make sure that you see it as God gives it, not as you want it to be. Listen, Jesus Church, man, this has been amazing. But I'm going to tell you something. We're about to make a transition into what we're calling Jesus the King coming soon. Jesus is coming back. How do we prepare for that? That's where we're going to dive in throughout the rest of the year. Jesus the King coming soon. You're not going to want to miss this. It's going to be awesome. So let us know what God is doing in your heart. Let us know if you have any requests or prayer requests. Media Hub at thbshreveport.com. And uh, we will love to hear those things and get right back to you. God bless you. We love you.